I'm going to teach you the Life Runners handshake now that we're all Life Runners. So Life Runners, we do everything in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Turn to your neighbor. We do everything in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We got a handshake. How cool is that? Yeah. And you remember the high five verse. We got a high five verse. John 2, 5. Mary's last five words in the Bible. Recorded in the Bible. Do whatever, whatever, whatever. he tells you. Slap your neighbor a high five. We've got a handshake. We've got a high five verse. We got a jersey. We've got a cheer. We're really, we're really a team. And heaven is a team effort. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Awesome. So the title of this talk is Hope, Healing, and Heroic Virtue. It's like the three H's, you know, so we're going we're gonna to hit them. And my kind of icebreaker story to get us in the, the mode of all things pro-life is when we were doing that ceremony today at the cemetery dropping roses at that memorial to the unborn children that, that died. And, you know, there was, I was watching people, and, and it was a, just a really interesting mix of emotion. Um, you know, part of my emotion when I was thinking about it is, wow, how honoring, how beautiful. Like, I, I felt joyful about it. Like, these children, there was names on those little stones. And then I reflected about all those kids that were literally flushed on a toilet stool or literally put in you know, dumpsters or a bag and put on a truck and incinerated. And I, I paused there and thought, wow, like this is the right answer. These people matter, these little people. In their short lives, their lives mattered. People loved them. They were honored. It was the right answer. So I, my overall tone was, it was joyful for me. Like it, it really wasn't a sad experience. And I'm sharing emotions because isn't it interesting how we wrestle with how our emotions should be? Like you remember me yesterday when I talked about the life chain. I could see people on life chain and if you, because a lot of people in here have done Life Chain. A lot of people in here will get an opportunity to do Life Chain in your life. It's a great event in October. But people, I can tell, are really torn about how to portray themselves out in public, standing up for the unborn. And I wanted to let you know, and I made my case last night, it's okay to celebrate God's gift of life. That's pro-life. It's also okay when we face places like Planned Parenthood when we're facing that death camp to be solemn and to be overcome with just this sense of, wow, that's really sad. That's okay. That's appropriate. But when you're at those places, dare I say, you can have both those emotions and display them. You can turn towards it, and you can mourn for those children. And you can turn away from that evil. And you can give, give an image to the world looking away of hope. There's that first word. In attracting healing. That you're an approachable, attractive person with their hands up, waving, smiling, looking away from. I'm giving your emotions some it makes senseness because it's I, you feel all those tugs out there, like someone just honked. Do I do, do I wave back when someone honks? Because people are like da, 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 like we're for you, and I'm here to tell you yes. Someone does a da, 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 thumbs up. Give them a yeah. Don't feel like you gotta go. You know. <laughs> So I'm helping your mind process all the emotions 
of what it is we stand for. Okay? So the rose ceremony today in that cemetery, same kind of deal. You could see how you could, you could kind of go either way. And either way is probably okay, as I described it. How you're thinking about it, how you're meditating, how you're pondering it. But it elicited a memory for me. And it elicited a great memory for me. And maybe Bernadette's already catching up, like, what story is Pat going to tell? <laughs> but it's a story of Bernadette and I doing sidewalk outreach in front of Carhartt's abortion facility in Bellevue, Nebraska. This is the Leroy Carhartt that has his name on two Supreme Court decisions that were around partial birth abortion. In 03, the Supreme Court said that's okay to partially deliver a baby. The Supreme Court said it's okay to partially deliver a baby and snip its spine behind on its neck and then deliver a dead baby. And our Supreme Court in 2003 said, yeah, that's okay. And then 2007, after the court changed, the court said, no, uh, that's not okay. And of course, praise God today, 24 June 2022 in Ford, we're in a post-Roe America, where the court says, uh-uh, we're not protecting that as a right. My goodness, let's just keep praying that the court gets to the point, as I mentioned last night, where they go, not only are we going to stay neutral, but we're going to prohibit that. No different than prohibiting murder <coughs> and unjust killing. And so here we stand. And I see these roses being dropped. And the memory that it elicited was when we were standing in front of Carhartt's abortion facility. Um, I don't know if it was Bernadette. It's probably you. Pointed out there was a car. Yeah, you did. Pat. Yeah, she's nodding her head. Pat, there's a car across the street. Hurry, run over there before... They get out into the street, and then we only have seconds to meet them in the driveway of the abortion facility. She says, you know, like, run across, because you'll have more than a few seconds. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, so I ran across, and I met this young woman who was waiting for her appointment time across the street. Hi, my name's Pat. What's your name? Oh, nice to meet you, Mary. Are you here for an abortion appointment? Yes, I am. Okay. What would it take for you not to keep this appointment today? Well, I need this appointment. Why do you need this appointment? Because I made a mistake. Okay. Yeah, I had a one night stand. And it, you know, it was a mistake and I need to fix it. I'm like, well, this isn't gonna fix that mistake. I mean, you can redeem that, you can recover from that. You can learn from it, but this isn't going to fix it. So as a matter of fact, it's going to make whatever sense of that that was a mistake, and it's going to light it on fire in your life. This is not going to make that mistake go away. It's going to highlight it. But today's an opportunity where instead of adding a much bigger mistake on top of mistake, you can get help. You can get help and turn what you call a mistake into something's beautiful. Well, I'm not ready to be a mom. Well, you are a mom right now. She's like, oh, she kind of dipped her head down when I said that. I said, you are a mom. And I, I'm cheering you right now that you be a good mom. And going to this place isn't being a good mom. But we can help you. We can help you be a good mom. It's team effort. And she's just listening to me. And she's not responding. You know, she's not doing the like, yeah, or no. She's, you can tell she's just in shock. Pondering her situation, pondering my words, cognitive dissonance, which means there's a tension between two things. She's thinking this is a solution. I'm now saying, no, not only is it not a solution, it's a much bigger problem than whatever situation you're in. And she's got this stretching on her face and she just looks shell-shocked. So in that shell shock, I just reached out my hand like this and I said, hey, how about we walk next door and they're gonna get you some help 
you're not alone. And she goes like this. So she gets out of her car, and Bernadette probably watched this. We walked across on the other side of a uh, car support across the street. We walked up that side of the road, and guess what we collided with? We collided with a memorial that looked almost exactly like the one today that we put roses in front of. And guess what was in front of that memorial? A giant stack of roses, just like today. And praise God, I knew what those roses stood for. Each rose was for a child that had been aborted that day. And so, or that week, you know, until they moved away, you could see there was a stack. So each child for however long, then reset. But each rose represented an unborn baby that was aborted. And there was a stack. We get to that memorial, and I just pause with her. I didn't say anything. She, on her own, said, what are the roses for? So I was like, wow. So it's not like I even was like trying to, you know? I was afforded an opportunity to just answer her question. I said, well, each of those roses is an aborted child. And then I looked at her and I said, and I am really praying that your child doesn't end up a rose on that pile. And then she started crying, just weeping, like that real, you know, you know, just shoulder shaking, crying, deep cry. And so I looked at her and I said, hey, would it be okay if I gave you a hug? She said, yeah. And gave her a hug and she did that kind of hug where you just collapse. The body collapses in, if you know that hug, just rah. And then I looked at her and I said, um, when's the last time you had a hug? And she said, a really long time. So patch all that together in your mind. I mean, there's a lot there. We could probably spend the next 20 minutes just talking about all the elements of that story. But I'll just finish with the last element. <coughs> Love will end abortion. I mean, someone who's, remember you, you heard me say last night, setting up tonight's talk, I said, we're going to get to healing today. And remember, I said, healed people, heal people. Hurt people, hurt people. So healing is, flows out of love. So when we're reaching out a healing hand, we're loving someone. It's loving to heal. It's not loving to hurt. So you can see this dichotomy of someone who said it's been a really long time since I've had a hug. You've got a hurt, wounded person going into an abortion facility. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Brad wasn't here for the talk. He's like, what just happened? So this is the, when someone says, God bless you, bless them back. And God bless you too. Yeah, Brad's like, got it. Yeah. And it's delightful, Brad. You're going to love it. The return blessing. Um, so hope, healing, and heroic virtue. Look at that story. For her? Hope. She was ho hopeless. There's an abortion facility across from St. Louis in Granite City, Illinois, called the Hope Clinic. An abortion facility called the Hope Clinic. It's like lie and lie. I mean, you mean the hopeless abortion facility? They don't offer hope. They're taking hope. They're, they're fueled on hopelessness. People that show up there are not filled with hope. It's just such a giant, gleaming lie. And to call your facility, just like we said last night, it's a lie to call an abortion facility an abortion clinic. It's a lie on the title. Or the Bellevue Health Clinic, as ours is called. There's nothing healthy about an abortion facility. So we think about real hope. That young lady, 
who, by the way, had driven an hour and a half, sitting there waiting, you know, she now has hope. And but that story was at least a year and a half ago. So not only that is, she also has her child in her arms right now. I mean, praise God, you know? And then healing. The healing began that day for her. The healing began that day. Why? Because one of us, many parts of one body, reached out to her in love. Love is healing. Encouragement is healing. Encouragement is loving. You can feel your body heal when you get a hug. You can feel your body heal when you get a high five. Talk to people that work in health care or assisted living facilities. Talk to them about how faith impacts the elderly's quality of life. Or in a hospital, how faith impacts someone getting well. Come on. This makes sense. And sometimes we, we don't ponder or reflect on things that are obvious. But when you start understanding the things that you're learning at Pro-Life Boot Camp, how we engage the culture, whether it's the stats. You learn here that one in five pregnancies, this is prior to Roe v. Wade falling, and of course these numbers are going to change in the years ahead. But snapshot, one in five pregnancies in America are aborted. One in four women in their, in their childbearing age has had an abortion. When you hear the stats like that, like one, two, three, four, five. What's your name? Ben. ben. Good to see you again, Ben. Ben, who knows Ben? Everybody knows him now. Just raise your hand. Everyone knows Ben. We've been together for two days. So you imagine Ben not being born. And it's weird. It's peculiar. Think about those in a school that have had a classmate die in a car accident. Anyone been in a, had a student in your school die of a disease or a car accident? Who's had this? Yeah, suicide. This is one classmate. Imagine how it just how everyone felt. It was it was odd. It, everyone was off in the school. The school was off. You know, maybe the school took a day off. They closed the school for a day. Offered counseling for students. That's one peer. Schools, in reality, one out of five, 20% of every school, those students were aborted, murdered in their mother's wombs. And of course, it's been normalized. It's not normal for us. We talked about that last night. There's nothing normal about abortion. Remember, we even got like chuckling about how weird it is. Like, yeah. And that was to encourage us to speak up. And when the world's saying something ridiculous, and I gave that little sense, remember when I put that, my hands on your shoulders, can I put my hand on your shoulders again? Sure thing. And said, feel that responsibility to say, wait a minute, classmate, wait a minute, football player, teammate, basketball player, so that doesn't make sense. Think about what you just said. The story I told last night about the, I'm pro-choice, but I'm, I'm not for abortion. I'm like, well... Abortion's one of the choices. You're not for that. You're for life. Yeah, I'm for life. Well, I, I guess you're pro-life. Well, I guess I am. That quick. Just by defining terms and speaking up and saying that doesn't make sense. So loving. So we got hope. Healing. I'm, so my insight is healing comes from loving True speaking, reaching out, being compassionate. You know, compassion is something you can see. Like when I watch Bernadette do sidewalk outreach, it's interesting thinking back, Bernadette, the first time I saw you do sidewalk outreach. You were, you desperately love those people. Are you reflecting on yourself? Right, before you had training, before I'm like, hey, you know. Um, yeah, you, you desperately love them, but you love them in, in any way that you could. You love them like we talked about last night, seeing a car heading for a cliff. That's how you love them. And then since then, of course, you've learned that 
hey, if I, if I wave my arms like this about the cliff, they, they're like, oh my gosh, something's wrong with that person. They keep driving towards the cliff or whatever analogy. We've had to learn like, how to even get their gaze, haven't we, Bernadette? And you know what's interesting, everyone, as I was talking about emotions and how we portray ourselves? Guess what the most powerful thing to stop cars on the sidewalk is? What do you think? Do, look at Paul. What's Paul doing right now? There's two things he's doing. One, waving. smiling. Two, waving. he's waving. <laughs> Bottom line, joy. He's, he's he, hey, he's, he's greeting. Right. That's the most powerful way to stop cars. Good morning at an abortion facility. And, it, and it's counterintuitive, kind of. It's, you know, like you're feeling inside, just so you're staying with me with why this is important that we're dissecting our emotions so that we can understand, so that we can relate like them versus us. Like, we want to be like you were, Bernadette. When I saw you, like, stop! I mean, Bernadette would like, yeah! You know, I mean, she'd stand in front of the car, hands up, don't do this! I mean, I mean, she was like, oh my, you know, I think back on it. She's giggling herself. <laughs> and cry. No! When they go in. And, and she had to just, with, with grace and wisdom, and big W wisdom comes the Holy Spirit, and we had to modify our compassion. We had to suffer with them in a way that was attractive to them so that we had a moment for them to see us, so they had a moment to hear us. And by the way, it's holy to see people. Homeless people, look them in the eye. What's your name? Greet them by name. Someone who's suicidal, eyes down, glum. Hey, get their eyes. Hey, shake their hand. It's that interaction that we learned of how to relate to them. If we could get them to roll down a window and get them to reach their hand out and get that contact, you know, and, and say, hi, my name is Pat. What's your name? My name is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Really good to meet you. Hey, I love your, the watch. I just got one of those for my daughter, Paige, for her birthday. Oh, hey, I took the day off work today to help you. Oh. Are you here for an abortion appointment? Well, hey, what would it take for you to not keep this appointment today? What is it that you need that makes you think that you need this? You know? And have that moment. And hand that resource card off, like I handed out, we handed out yesterday. There's a version of cards on our website for those that do sidewalk outreach. It's a card for handing them. That card you got last night is for you for knowing stats and resources. But if you do sidewalk outreach, liferunners.org slash gear, if you want to write it down. And this is a card that's been really well thought out. I brought the science research to Sidewalk Advocates for Life. I was their research advisor when their ministry started back in 2012, 11 and 12. So I brought that study to them. It's something that I'd worked on. And then we have a card for handing them. And it has your name, your number on it, and the three things that she needs to know. One, there's resources next door. Two, there's, if you took the chemical abortion pill, there, there's a reversal pill, 24 to 72 hours. And three, if you had the abortion, here's a number for help sorting that out and healing. So, here we are. We're, we're learning about how to be for them. We're learning about how to be compassionate. Definition, if you want to write it down, it's great to know definition of words. Compassion means to suffer with. And if you don't have a pen and paper, you're wrong. Get a pen and paper or a note taker. Because you've got Halfheimer's, whether you realize it or not. Otherwise, you'd be getting, you'd be getting every answer on every test right. <laughs> but you don't because you don't remember everything that was said in class or that you read in a book. So that's why you got a pen and a paper. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah. So, um, hope, healing, heroic virtue. In that hope, 
how do we maintain hope? How are we a beacon for hope? We live in our identity. If you're living in your identity, you're like, well, what's our identity? Our identity, by definition, I love stats because the numbers don't lie. I love definitions when it's a right definition, a real definition. So we'll presume when I say definition, meaning the real definition, not all these lied definitions that are going on in our culture. But definitions matter. So identity, what's our identity with people that are wearing crosses on our shirts? Our identity, by definition, is that we are priest, prophet, and king. Write that down if you didn't know that. That's who you are. And if this is a news flash for you, oh, happy day. Because how cool are those three words? You're like, really? Yeah. Yep, you. Wearing that shirt with a cross on your chest. You, Christian. You who identify as a Christian. Who are you? What is your identity in Christ? Who did Jesus say that you are? You are who Jesus said that he is. You represent Christ as a Christian. Represent, you represent. You represent Christ as priest, prophet, and king. So as priest, what do priests do? This is priest small p, not the ordained priest. But what do priests do? They offer sacrifice. When you wear that shirt right now, whether it's cool when you're around some hardcore pro-lifers like people in this room, you're like, this really isn't much of a sacrifice for me. I actually want to wear this shirt today. Like, you know, that's brilliant. Like, what? But do know, even if you don't feel the sacrifice, because you've been working out your pro-life faith for long, like, yeah, I picked this dumbbell up, and I don't even realize I'm holding it anymore. <laughs> I've got so many pro-life reps in. <laughs> I come to the sidewalk, and when people flip me off, I just bless them. Because they're giving me that number one sign. And I'm inviting them to join me. Number one, all the way to heaven. Join me. I mean, your perspective changed. Things are lighter. And that makes sense. Why? What did Jesus say? Follow me and your yoke will be easy. Think about it, everyone. He didn't say, if you've never heard a good homily, he didn't say, you won't have a yoke. So what he said is, you're still going to be carrying your yoke. But you have, man, yeah, yeah, pro-life boot camp, 6 a.m., woo, we're doing PT. You have exercised your faith. Your yoke feels easy. So in your identity, even though you're like, there's no big deal putting the shirt on, guess what, everybody? Maybe it doesn't feel like a sacrifice to you, but when the world looks at you wearing that shirt, trust me, they're like, wow, that kid got up this morning and put that shirt on. Uh, older adults in here, older people, we see a young person rolling through a grocery store at a movie theater in this shirt. Is everyone with me that you're going, wow. Sacrifice. Why do we say, wow, sacrifice? Because, Brad, we're thinking back when we were that age. And we're doing the, like, I don't know if I would have put that shirt on when I was 15. Right? We're doing that little comparative assessment. Like, that kid is, one of the words on our list for today, heroically virtuous. If you've got that shirt on, now granted, we're in the, like the superhero's cave right now. We're like in Antioch in the first Christian church. Who's been to Antioch, the first Christian church? Okay, I have. I've been in the cave where St. Peter, Bishop, first church, Antioch, cave, been there. That's this. Who's been to Cappadocia in Turkey? That's this. Cappadocia, if you remember in the Acts of Apostles, the Christians were in hiding down in the the, the, the caves they dug out of the limestone in Cappadocia, I cruised through all those caves where the early Christian church was. That's us right now. We're in a safe place in our Christian hideout right now. But are you going to keep that shirt on when you roll back home? 
Are you going to, when you see the reminder on Tuesday afternoon from us to wear your witness tomorrow, are you slapping that shirt on when you go to school on the first Wednesday of the month? If they have a uniform like you and I talked about, are you going to be bold enough to go look the principal in the eye and say, hey, would you please approve for such a time as this, this shirt at our Catholic school to wear this? We've got, we want to start a Life Runners chapter, but we need your approval to wear this. Matthew 25, 40, write that down to motivate your principal. Read that to him. For what you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. That's Jesus talking. Really tug at him. Saying, why do I think you should do it? Let me read Matthew 25, 40 to you. Read that to your principal. And then watch your principal go, I just got outranked. Not by you, but by the king of the universe. So, sacrifice. Priest, prophet, king. So as a priest, you are offering sacrifices. And it matters. The world looks at that and is inspired. Think of the real word of inspired, in spirit. You increase the confidence of the world. What does confidence mean? Confide, with faith. These are the real meanings of the words, everybody. The world hijacks all these words, secularizes these words. But when you're living in your identity, you're living in the real meaning of these words. So you put that shirt on, and you're living as priest, offering sacrifice. How about prophet? What do prophets do? And of course, your first notion of prophet is like, oh, they foresee the future. What do prophets do? They proclaim the word, the truth. Now, there's different ways of being prophetic. You could be prophetic with words of knowledge. That's from past to present. You heard the talk last night from, from the priest, uh, the exorcist, that said that demons, there's a mirror image of the, the realm of the, the spirit world that's good. A lot of those same conditions and characteristics you see in the realm that's not good. The evil spiritual world. The holy spiritual world. And you remember him saying that those demons knew stuff. The demons were being, you know, they were, they were like mind readers. But is it really prophecy? It's truth from the fact that what they just said might have been true about your life. So in some respect, yeah, go ahead, Mother. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So out of behaviors. Yeah. And so they're saying things like, how did they know this? Like Father was talking about. Demons are rattling off stuff. Like, how do you know that? Someone even told a story, I think, at a workplace where the demons knew something. So a pattern, study, like Mother said. But prophetic is truth speaking. So look at your shirt again. What's truth speaking about your shirt? And this is you don't even have to utter a word. You've got Jeremiah 1.5 on there. Is that prophetic? It is. When you're quoting scripture, are you being prophetic? You are. You are. Can you also be prophetic where the Holy Spirit can grant you words of knowledge? Yeah. The apostles, the disciples, us, are equipped with the gifts of the Spirit, and you can have wonderful prophetic words for one another. We're going to do that this afternoon. We're going to pray over each other. So prophet, truth speaking, what does Jeremiah 1.5 say? I think it's all, all over. I've seen it written down on a few of these little placards. What's that verse? That God knew us even before we were in our mother's wombs. That's what he said to Jeremiah. Hey, Jeremiah, I knew you even before you were in your mother's womb. So when you run the gauntlet of pro-life, I always save theology for last, and that was that Jeremiah 1.5. But we've, last night we touched on biology, life begins at conception. I spoke it with authority as a member of the field of science. We read the American Medical Association statement from 1859. From philosophy, we know, if, remember I said any academic angle, there's no controversy with being pro-life, it's truth. From philosophy, first do no harm. That's the Hippocrates oath that all medical doctors used to take. Would you believe that they've modified the Hippocrates oath and they've even left it out of some medical schools now? 
Does that make sense? It does make sense because they're training those residents on abortion. How can you, in good faith, term intended, take the Hippocratic's oath? Hippocrates oath? I stood on the island of Kos in the clinic where Hippocrates penned that oath. Pretty cool, huh? Greek island of Kos when I lived in Turkey for two years on Asia Minor. So prophetic. So your identity is priest, your identity is prophet to speak truth. And then king. What's our kingly identity? What does that even mean? It means that, remember, we represent Christ, so our kingly identity is that the king of the universe said to us, if you, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, St. Jerome. If you know your scripture, Jesus said to us, hey, you follow me? You live in me as priest, prophet, and king. You're going to be able to not only do the things that you saw me do, you're going to be able to even do greater things. What? I'll say it again if you missed that. Jesus said to each of us, you follow me, live in the spirit, live in your identity as priest, prophet, and king. You'll be able to do even greater things than you saw me do. So what does that mean? Basically, the analogy, Aiden, is imagine the king looking to his son. And tell me if this helps this a little bit. Looking to his son and saying, hey, you have my authority, son. You have the authority of me, the king. When you represent, represent me. And you through the power of the Holy Spirit, through you know, sources that are going to be given to you, granted to you by me, in union of the three persons of God, you are going to be able to do even mightier things as the gospel unfolds, as God's covenants unfold, as our road to heaven unfolds. That should be exciting to every one of us here. But dare I say, it could also make you tremble a little bit in fear. And fear is the F word, everybody. It's the spiritual F word. When we say fear, like Bernadette treats it like that. She's like, oh, fear? And I say, oh, I mean concern. Because I'll say, oh, I'm afraid. She's like, you're afraid? That's a swear word in Christianity. 365 times in Scripture, be not afraid. We're not supposed to be afraid. Why? because of our identity as priest, prophet, and king. Because our confidence in that Christ has us. Look how the exorcist priest, Father, is it Dan? Father Bob. Father Bob? How he spoke. Fearless. Fear is the opposite of faith. We need to check ourselves on that. That's how the story I told last night about the Coptic Christians. Obviously, they weren't living in fear. No one, I mean, wouldn't you think like one of them would be like, okay, I got a family, hood off. No, not one of them denounced Christ in that story about those Coptic Christians in 2015. I wouldn't say they were afraid. They're faithful. So when you wear that, you wear it as priest making a sacrifice, prophet, you don't have to say a word. There's truth all over you. Matthew 25, 40, remember the unborn, what you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, a cross, Holy Spirit dove, the power that gives you the graces and the courage, proclaiming life, a verse, sacrifice, prophet, truth, and then king, you walk in your kingly identity. You have the forces of the kingdom behind you. Boom! Everybody, I hope that pondering right now isn't like a, oh, man. I hope it's a, oh, yeah. Like, be excited about your identity. Because once you start living in your identity, everything changes. I mean, Bernadette got to have a front row seat for me acting like I was about nine watching people be healed. And 
she's, and I look over at her and she's like, oh gosh, <laughs> Pat, act like you've been in the end zone before, you know? <laughs> I can't help it. You know, when you're standing there last fall and a guy with two hearing aids and has the voice influx of a hearing impaired person, that mute, muted kind of muffled voice tone, comes over and says, will you pray over me for my he- ears to be healed? And I'm like, oh, here we go. Priest, prophet, and king, live in your identity. Do what Jesus did. Jesus, anyone that asked him, he reached out a healing hand. Are you tapped into your identity? Luke 9, verse 2, I said it last night as a closer, what's going to happen today? Proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the wounded, and deliver people from evil. Are we all of us really doing all three things that Jesus asked all of us to do. We are the multitudes. In case you're like, oh, he just said that to the apostles. He did. And he also said it to the 70 and 72. True. And he also said it to the, quote, multitudes. That's us, folks. We're in there. So when that came, of course, Bernadette, Miss Healing Twinkle Toes, you bet we'll pray over you. And I'm like, oh. Why am I, oh? Because I'm like, oh, I don't want to let him down. I don't want to look stupid. What if he's not healed? I've had priests tell me that they don't pray healing over people because they're afraid that it's not going to happen. And what we got to realize is someone said this. I don't know if it was in a talk or in conversation. Maybe it was someone shared this about it wasn't, yeah, it was Brad in our road, road trip. You shared the story of the exorcist that said he heard Jesus tell him, get out of my way. You're not doing it. I am through you. That story you told in the car. That's healing. It's not us. If the person, something always happens. Write this down. When you pray over someone for healing, something always happens. That I believe. And Brad's nodding. The people that are like wearing clothes set aside going, look at me, sacrifice. I didn't want to wear this today, but I'm going to wear it again and I'm going to wear it tomorrow. So, you know, sacrifice, even though you might, no, actually I've kind of gotten used to it. (laughs) Whatever. It's still a sacrifice. Same analogy as I shared on the Life Runner shirt. So, you write that down because something always happens. Always. You just might not be able to see what happened. Yet. You might not always know what happened. Ever. But something in all the people of faith did this when I made that statement. When you pray over someone in the name of Jesus, something always happens. And could you justify that there's some form of healing with every pray over asking you? Yes. Let that encourage you to get over the F word, fear, and do what Jesus asks us to do, and that is to lay hands on each other in healing and pray over each other. And you know what, everyone? We all need healing. All of us. Everyone in the room needs healing. The devil works with pride, power, and payment. And if you're like, oh, I don't really need healing. It's probably somewhere in the pride word. Um, If you're like, oh, I don't want to bother God, that's not living in your identity because that's not our God. Our God is egging us on for more. I don't think we really know God if you think you're bothering him. I don't think you've met him. I don't think you have a relationship with him. Because if you did, you realize God is limitless, boundaryless, merciful, gracious, has no problem with problems. Feel free to write that down. God doesn't have a problem with problems. Think about what our smartphones can do that we, the created, put together. Imagine what God can do. God made us, and we put this together. And it's fascinating 
the, the number of work steps that happen here. Trust me, folks, God has no problem taking care of every person's prayers at the same time on the planet. And by us like, oh, not wanting to bother God, we just don't know our God then. So we all need healing. We need to accept healing. We need to ask for healing. Why? Because in that wholeness, we are going to be able to live out our ministry. Ooh, time out. Our ministry, you bet. Every person in here has a ministry. In this priest-prophet thing, there's a flavor of your ministry with each word. You have a priestly aspect to your ministry. Ponder it. What's the sacrificial piece of your ministry? Could be putting on a t-shirt, walking out in the world. That's, yeah. Um, prophetic. What truth are you to be speaking? And king, what in the name of Jesus are you being called to do today? But feel responsible that in your personal ministry, as priest, prophet, and king, every day live in your identity. Okay, and then what flows when you live in your identity? Hope, healing, heroic virtue. That's what flows from your real identity. And it, that, that supernatural becomes natural. This is just what you do. It becomes... Normal, as intended by God. And think about people in your life that are living out that identity. They're attractive. And there's a bunch of them in this room right now. I mean, this, you over there, you're attractive. You're like, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're like, huh. How you spoke today, Brad? Loved it. <laughs> docile in the spirit was a term that you said today to be docile in the spirit yeah Attra not grasping the, you know people in this room when I look out in 90% of, of communication is body language there's a lot of people in this room that aren't grasping at anything your hands, how I look at you, are just open to receive whatever it is that God wants to give you today. As little or as much as he wants to give you. And that's beautiful. We're in Cappadocia right now. We're in Antioch right now, hanging out in that cave. We're fearless. And we need the body of Christ. Why do you form little Life Runners chapter? Because one... When you know that two or three or four or five or six or ten other people in your school are counting on you to also show up in your jersey. Heaven's a team effort. Why else? One Life Runner shirt, imagine two, how about three, how about four shirts at, a, at, at the movie theater? How about seven of you walking in front of the school before school starts with a sign? Can you see the magnification of that witness when we team up together? than just one person? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with a couple stories and I'm going to take some questions and then I'm going to give you a hey, see you later. And in faith, it's always a see you later. No, you're going to leave them in prayer, right? Yes, that's all in there too. Oh, Brent's like, hey. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, someone asked what's, yeah. Yep, Brent's like, oh, we're doing it. She's egged me on so many times. There was an eighth grader. We went to an eighth grade confirmation retreat. And, and yeah. And uh, Bernadette's in the, like this, like she is right now. And she's pointing at this girl on crutches while I'm talking about healing. And she's going like this. And I'm like, oh, man. And she, and she gives me a this from the back while she's taping. Like, you're just going to talk about it? Or, <laughs> yeah. And so I said, hey, who would be willing to put their hands on? And I asked her, would you like to be healed? And she's like, yeah. It, with her ankle all busted up. And I said, would it be okay if we laid hands on her? Yeah. So all her confirmation classmates, class of 30 or 40 kids, all laid hands on her. 
Bernadette, you were there. We got two eyewitnesses. Took off her wrap, dropped her crutches, just like something out of the Bible, and ran around. And I did the question, like, before when you walked in? Like, no, I couldn't even put weight on it. Her parents come in and give testimony. She couldn't even bear weight when she got in the car. And so the parents gave testimony. And you remember who's seen the Chosen series? Do you remember when the paralytic was healed and he just started walking around town going, yeah, yeah, Jesus did it. And how the word just spread? Giving testimony. So we're going to do that. Um, so there's one story. Heroic virtue, Bernadette's hoping I don't get to Mount Kilimanjaro, but I'm going to at least touch on it again. She was, she was uh, I know she wants me to get into the be not afraid stuff here as we close. So, um, hope, healing, heroic virtue, I, I labeled just wearing that shirt, uh, heroic virtue. But, and I mentioned last night, maybe it's enough. Maybe this is how God intended it. If you want to like, come over like, yeah, that's the flag that was on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. I promise you I'd bring it again. That's there. And, you know, when I think about going up that mountain, you think about all the things in Scripture about shouting the truth from the mountaintops. We were invited by a bishop who is in the lineage of the apostles. I just felt like, okay, God. And walking up that mountain, thinking, huh, 19,000 feet in the middle of nowhere, walking up here to put this flag at the top. And does it really matter? You know? But when you plant seeds of sacrifice, when you take time out of your life to come to this boot camp, when I think back to the Vita Institute that you and I spent two weeks of our life in, it's picking up that starfish. Who's heard the story of the starfish and the in the sea, yeah. The little boy, thousands of starfish washed up on the sea, picking them up, throwing them back. And that wise, older adult comes up to the boy and says, what are you doing? There's thousands. It doesn't matter. Picked up the next starfish and said, matters to this one, and threw it back. So the seeds of sacrifice prophecy, speaking truth to a teammate, it matters. So we're going we're gonna to finish, and thank you Bernadette for egging me on like you do, teamwork. <laughs> um, and we're going to turn healing inward on ourselves. And there's going to be uh, an opportunity, first of all, does anyone have any discernible pain in your body? Like, yeah, you know, I've got this back pain, discernible, like, like you have pain maybe right now. If you were to stand on an ankle, your back, a neck, any discernible pain in your bodies. And if you do, and if you want to be healed, and you remember in The Chosen, you remember that scene when Jesus said, what do you want? And the paralytic had to say, I want to be healed. He's like, okay. So first step is, do you want to be healed? And if you do, if that's you, stand up. If you have discernible pain, you want to be healed, stand up. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I did a men's retreat, 700 men in Boston a couple months ago. Uh, gave a presentation. And I uh, gave them the opportunity, if they were post-abortion, had driven someone to a, into an abortion facility to stand up for healing. Yeah. And we had eight stand up at first. And then four more stood up after those eight were healed. And then those eight prayed over the other four. That really happened. Bernadette was there. Oh yeah. Yep. And so, so we've seen lots. Lots. Yeah, shoulders healed back. When, when I say lots, I mean I've had inner healing with a priest who had a, he couldn't hardly walk. Yep. At, 
Oh yeah, Father Magnan. Yep. Hobbled too. As well. Yeah. You got to start by being open. And so this is, you've heard this message, and it takes a little courage. So now I'm going to ask if anyone has any inner healing needs. So it could be you're, you're mad about something. Maybe there's some unforgiveness in your life. Maybe you, your brother or sister died in an accident or one of your parents died of cancer. You're struggling. Yeah. Two, like I was like, oh yeah, I'm not going to be able to shower. Or I'm not going to be at, like this is going to be really hard for me. And really, <laughs> really, it was way harder than that. <laughs> it but was. Also, like our our sacrifice and stuff. Like God always blesses so much more yeah. than what we could ever give in our sacrifice and suffering. And like I, I, Mount Kilimanjaro helped me like understand some of like how the wonderful suffering was we beg for it and like Mount Kilimanjaro was that one of those many stepping stones God gave me that like just really helped me be like wow I'm so grateful like just to know his great love because that little bit of sacrifice to like take that holy Eucharist up there for social media and, and the yep. remember the unborn yeah, an image of the Eucharist like, And where we tie that story in is we tie it to wearing the jersey. You know, whether you're carrying a flag up Mount Kilimanjaro that says, Remember the Unborn, those images from the top of Mount Kilimanjaro were shared around the world. LifeSite News did a, a nice cover article on, on that Mount Kilimanjaro pilgrimage to put a pro-life flag at the top of the tallest freestanding mountain in the world. And so we're that flag. You know, we're climbing our own little Mount Kilimanjaro. So I'm going to give one more call out. There's anything in your life you want to be healed from. Anything. Yes. Yep. Yeah, praise God. Do I need to remind everyone that everybody has something that needs healing? Otherwise, you'd be like perfect human. You'd be Jesus in need of no healing or Mary. It's just you taking a moment. So when you stand up, you are living out your Christian identity in the term vulnerable. Does anyone know the definition of vulnerable? The, the real definition. To show one's wounds. So what you just did is what? Christ did. And we all know, because we all have some catechesis, we have, we have spiritual exercises in this room. If you've come to this room, you have a story, a story of faith. It's in our vulnerability, which, call it how the world calls it, when you're vulnerable, the world would say, a weakness. You're vulnerable. But what did St. Paul remind us? He said it was in his weaknesses is where Christ was strong. So, most, go ahead, Bernadette. He boasts in his weakness because that's where Christ was able to be magnified. So the fact that we've all stood, um, God will magnify us through our vulnerability. So now, I want you to turn to someone next to you. If you, I mean, this is obviously optional. If you can be the next step vulnerable and share with them what you want to be healed from. Turn to someone near you and share. Put it to words. Just grab a partner and share with someone next to you. Just overhearing, um, I overheard someone saying that something they want to be healed from was fear, anxiety. Great thing to be healed from. Right thinking, whoever said that. That's right thinking, to be healed from fear. I like it. Yep, I like it.
Because wholeness would be fearless. You know your identity. You live in Christ. You're going to live in God's will. Even it means that today you'll be called to profess his name to your last breath. So be it. I'm sold out. I've died to self. I no longer live for me. I live for you, Lord. Okay, so you've, you've, you've had an opportunity to share that vulnerability. We're going to pray three times, and then we're going to ask... Um, we're going to ask Brad to seal this at the end, just to give him a heads up that he's going to be sealing everything that God did in this room. And we're going to seal it against any attacks from the devil to bring doubt to what God's doing in this room. So three prayers. So the first thing I want everyone to just go ahead and get postured to receive the Holy Spirit, to receive. So posture yourself. Just receive. So we know wherever two or more are gathered, God is here. So we've been living in prayer, folks. I mean, we, we haven't left it. We've been praying unceasingly. So we just, we bear witness right now that there's a thickness in this room. It's, it's holy. My analogies to Antioch, my analogies to Cappadocia. I mean, God's people are alive and well. Yeah. The authority has the right to do that. You don't have the authority, yep. not this bread. Yep. So, yeah, so if you look at the seal and to yeah. do that kind of a thing, it has to flood with authority. That's what Father Bob said just yesterday. Yeah. So I, I appreciate what you're yeah. trying to do. Graduate from the Encounter School of Ministry with Father um, Nealon, certificate holder. Fully trained. I teach it in Omaha with Father Mike. The Encounter School of Ministry. Fully certified. Yep. But thank you. I don't know what that is. Yeah. There's a campus in Cincinnati. The Encounter School of Ministry. Yep. I still don't know what it is. Worldwide. Yeah. It's a school of healing. That's nice. I still don't know what it is. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you more about it. So, as we, as we enter into... Like we talked about last night, there's always going to be um, tension in that spirit. So there's tension with people stood up. There's tension with what are you going to share. That tension, when you feel that tension, run, run towards it. That's the training from the Encounter School of Ministry through Father Thielen. And that fear, when you see that fear, that, that, that fear is going to be instead of you running away from it, that needs to be, in most cases, an opportunity for, oh, I'm being discouraged. There's something that does not want me in this space. This is very complimentary to last night with the exorcist talk. So whatever those, those tension points, which is what Mother and I were just talking about, um, there's a surrender in that. Okay? So we've still been preparing to pray. So I want you to go ahead and you can have your eyes closed, eyes open. Interesting thing, learning to pray with your eyes open. Why would you do that? So that you can see the person you're praying over. Seeing where they're at. Interesting, huh? That took some training. Counterintuitive to have your eyes open while praying. But you're welcome to have your eyes open. I'm giving you uh, some, some permission of something that might seem peculiar to you and why you would do that. Because you want to watch the person you're praying over. They could be overcome, they could be emotional, and you want to know that when you're loving and supporting them. So right now, as we begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I'd like you to repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, Jesus. do you want to heal me now? I want you to look to Jesus, I want you to commune with Jesus, I want you to speak to Jesus right now. If you have never done that in a personal way, find an image of Jesus, a crucifix on the wall, a picture from your room, your grandma's house, and relate to Jesus in a real way. So a three-dimensional way. And we're going to ask him again, Jesus, Jesus. do you want to heal me now? 
Did anyone get an audible, like, because people talk like this, like, like God asked me to. If that's you and your spirituality, I'm giving you permission, that's okay. There's lots of people that talk just like that. God said to me, God asked me, God told me. Um, did anyone get an audible, like Jesus answering that question? Just giving you permission that that's not unusual. Okay? Um, did anyone get a sense of uh, a nod, uh, anything, intuiting anything in your prayer? These are the people that have really deep prayer lives. Paul's given a, uh, Paul? Yeah. Yep, we're going to, yep. So Paul's like, yeah. So, um, in the name of Jesus, I pray the authority that lives in us as priest, prophet, king to bind any spirits of muteness or deafness. We bind them and we place them at the foot of the cross. Re if everyone could repeat after me, Jesus. Jesus. Would you like to heal me now? Would you like to heal me now? <laughs> Love signal graces. Anybody get any sense? Any audible? Any? I got a smile and a nod over here. Anything from? Is it Fuller? Anything? Uh, what? Just like a shift in heart, you know? A shift in your heart. Okay, sense. Okay, where at? Over here, Amy? A, a sense of, of joy, a feeling of going from very sad and oppressed and concerned. About I, I love it. Others in the room to just feeling, it's okay, like I got this. I love it. I, it's not my shoulder, joy. So this is a very rhetorical question. So, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to present it this way. Every person in the Bible that asked Jesus for healing received healing. Go challenge that. Go bust out your Bibles. So what do you think is the answer to the, to the question, does Jesus want to heal you now? Absolutely yes is the answer. Why? This is what he does. Um, healing and salvation, or salve, salvation, is to be full. When we are saved, we are healed. We have wholeness in the Lord. So, you bet he wants to heal you. You bet he's going to heal you. You can accept some of that healing now, that progression of healing, but we're all going to be healed for eternity. So, a big part of it is, is connecting the mind to the heart to the soul, and I'm giving you the answer right now. Yes, Jesus wants to heal you now. So, um, here we go. I want you to pray over your friends. So we, we got kind of partners going. Is that what we got? Because you paired up. Okay, and you know what that person wants healing from or healing for. So if you could lay hands on your friend and we'll kind of go back and forth here as we go through this. So, so one's going to go first and then the other. So whoever's going first, look, look to your friend and say, in the name of Jesus, be healed, be healed, and then whatever it is that they asked to be healed from. Could be anxiety, could be back pain, could be something in your neck, God bless you, could be some arthritis. Go and try it out. So if there was something discernible, the person just got prayed over, try that out. Like if it was your shoulder, if it, if, and if you're like, hey, I, wanna, I have something else. Like, yeah, why didn't I ask for my shoulder? You can ask them to pray over your shoulder. Okay, try it out. Okay, now switch. Remember, th we're going to do three prayers. Okay, we're going to switch. So you know what your friend wants. So here we go. We're going to switch in the name of Jesus. Be healed. And then whatever it is your friend asked. And may your confidence go up in knowing Scripture. Luke chapter 9, verse 2. Jesus asks all of us to proclaim the kingdom of God. That's prophet. 
to heal the wounded. That's our kingly identity. And deliver people from evil. Kingly identity. Doing the same things that Jesus did. That's what he asked us. We're doing it for real right now. So try it out. The person just got prayed over. If it was anxiety, how you feeling? I liked Amy's, I liked her testimony. Like, you know, I'm feeling a release. I'm feeling like I'm taking an opportunity for healing right now. So after the first prayer, any testimony like Amy gave? Does anyone have testimony? Like, you know what? Something you felt, sensed, experienced, thought of. Any testimony in the room? Remember, this is what they did in the Bible. We're doing what the followers of Jesus did in the Bible right now. Go ahead, testimony. Mine was laziness. Okay. So, and you're feeling like, hey, let's, let's go ahead and pick this place up. and <laughs> You want to go flash on it right now. Yeah, I want to move. Okay. Joyful. Yeah, Brad. Yeah, I asked Jesus for healing from anxiety and tension and stress. Um, and just the fire of the Holy Spirit came yeah. out of my, my chest. Okay, there you go. Yeah, Bernadette's like, yeah. Okay. Second prayer. Here we go. Prayer number two. Um, I want everyone to think of something that in deliverance ministry that could be referred to as a blockage. So blockages are classically, typically, areas of unforgiveness. And Bernadette always stressed how important it is to put it from your lips. Because words have power. When you speak, this is from scripture as well, what we speak from our lips has the power of life and death. And anyone that does sidewalk outreach knows what I'm talking about. Just when we're blessing one another, we're doing it right now. So if there's someone in your life that you mm, kind of know that you haven't completely forgiven, take that opportunity right now. And that is a huge factor in receiving healing. So talk to your partner. If you want to let them know right now if there's someone that you're struggling with forgiveness. And if you'd like to take this opportunity to... In the name of Jesus, yep. I forgive. And we're going to do that yep, as a group here in a second. Yep. So talk about it for a second. And then we're going to give an opportunity for that forgiveness. Okay, so maybe you've excavated something, you're vulnerable, show one's wounds, that there's something. What a great opportunity to be free from it, um, some area of forgiveness. So let's go ahead and enter back into our prayer postures, and everyone repeat after me. And, and lay hands on one another, like you had, yep. We're doing it just like the apostles did it. How cool is that? In the name of Jesus... I forgive. I forgive, and then whoever that person is, you can say it quietly off your lips, but just but audible it. Whoever that person is, say their name. Four, Four. and then sh whatever that was that they, how they harmed you, what they did. And that's a release, and you've, you've released that. So now our second prayer. Here we go, and we can pray over each other at the same time. So everyone's going to be praying for their partner over each other. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Have complete healing. Have complete healing. Total, healing. Total healing. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus mighty name. Be healed from, and then share what that is. Try it out. If it's a shoulder, if it's a neck, if it's a knee, try skipping. I mean, we had one uh, deacon be healed in Colorado Spring from Bernadette just sharing about what we were about to do. He's like, there's something going on in my ankle. She's like, oh, and he gets up and he said, I couldn't walk across the street. Remember this, Bernadette, in Colorado Springs? 
And then he got on his one foot and he started hopping. And then his buddy goes, he had a hard time getting out of the car. I had to help him across the street. Healing, just talking about that we were going to do healing. That deacon was already like, bring it. He was already receiving healing. God's healing. So any testimony, that was prayer two. We're going to do prayer number three and then we're going to seal it. So any testimony from the second prayer. Like, hey, testimony has power. Testimony is loving. Testimony is generous. Because when you share testimony about what God's doing, it raises the faith of everyone else in the room. That's the power of testimony. Huge. So if you've got like, you know what? Okay, prayer number three. Last prayer for healing. With the authority as priest, prophet, and king, lay your hand on your friend. In the name of Jesus, In the name of Jesus. Be, healed. be healed. Okay, Brad, if you could um, seal this, this, uh, this, what God's done, all everything that's done, if we could burn up anything that's not of God, whatever prayer that you feel compelled, a deliverance style prayer of sealing what's happened today. Yeah, play it. Yes! <laughs> Love it. And would you like the group to pray over? McKinsey, are you okay with us praying over you? Boom! <laughs> Look at that light shining. Kenzie, do you have any testimony? You know what's going on with you? No. I, can I, just, I feel like I can heal everybody's hand. Yeah. Like, oh, like the whole room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Praise just, God. It just kind of feels like a domino, like definitely heavy here, but I, I don't know. I feel like I can just kind of feel it like yeah. spread out. Yeah. Awesome. Pouring India. Imparting. Yeah, and you feel really light, by the way. Like your body feels like you could shift it across like a shuffleboard right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she is a yeah. Awesome. Want to see all what God's done, right? Father, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. You who are sanctified, you who are holy. We ask that um, everyone who was healed today, or maybe who was healed tomorrow, from the mm, or right. in the weeks to come, we ask that they you may be glorified, that they may glorify you in everything. And know that this was you, not us. This was you and your gift of grace and your love for Mm. us. We ask that any unclean spirits we encounter through our lives, Mm. especially now, may be departed from us. That your spirit of truth and grace and love may rest upon us until you do. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'll leave you with this. Um, Forward to heaven. Keep your beatific vision. Stay heaven bound. Uh, remember what the goal is. Speak about heaven. Speak about your desire to be in heaven. Talk about heaven. And two things to write down. First thing I want you to write down. If you have any social media, share something that you learned at Pro-Life Boot Camp on your social media. That's homework assignment number one. And this homework assignment today is Saturday. This homework assignment is to be completed by Tuesday when you go to bed, okay? Second thing, invite somebody to be a life runner. Mom, dad, brother, sister, friend, invite someone. And the hardest thing is to get them registered. Help them register. Don't just invite them, but invite them and say, can I help you join the team, okay? Those are your two assignments. And you know what that's called, everybody? Evangelization. What's the last thing Christ asked all of us to do? 
to go forth and make disciples of all nations. God first, life always, teammates forever. Amen. Thanks for having us.